First, our first speaker will be Father John W. O'Malley, SJ. He is the University Professor of History at Georgetown University. He received his PhD in history from Harvard University in 1965. He has received many academic honors, including 20 honorary degrees, eight best book prizes, and in 2016, the Centennial Medal from the Graduate School of Harvard University, the school's highest honor. From 1979 until 2000, 2006, John O'Malley was Distinguished Professor of Church History at the Weston Jesuit School of Theology and since then has been at Georgetown University. In 1995, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Science and in 1997 to the American Philosophical Society. His best known book is The First Jesuits, Harvard University Press, 1993, now translated into 12 languages. Three of his most recent books with Harvard Press are What Happened at Vatican II, Trent, What Happened at the Council, and the subject of this symposium, Vatican I, The Council and the Making of the Ultramontane Church in 2018. In the spring of 2019, Harvard will publish When Bishops Meet, an essay comparing Trent, Vatican I, and Vatican II. Our second speaker is Russell Hittinger. He is the William K. Warren Professor of Catholic Studies and Research Professor of Law at the University of Tulsa. He is also a member of the Pontifical Academy of the Social Sciences and the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas. Hittinger is the author of many books, including A Critique of the New Natural Law Theory, The First Grace, Rediscovering Natural Law in a Post-Christian Age, Thomas Aquinas and the Rule of Law, and most recently, Paper Wars, Catholic Social Doctrine in the Modern State, which is forthcoming. <clears throat> Our third speaker is Joseph Mueller, SJ. He's the Associate Professor of Theology at Marquette University, where he has taught since 1999. He holds an STD and STL <clears throat> uh, from, the, from a center in Paris and specializes in ecclesiology and early Christian theology especially the church order literature of the first five centuries and its Old Testament exegesis. Father Mueller's book, The Old Testament and the Ecclesiology of the Fathers, a reading of the Apostolic Constitutions, was published in, 20, in 2005. He has published articles on priests and presbyters in antiquity and early Christianity, as well as an article on the Christology and fundamental theology in the first volume of Pope Benedict XVI's Trilogy on Jesus for Nova et Vetera, and he's currently working on a book-length treatment of the ancient church order tradition. So join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be here. The title of our symposium, as you know, is uh, loss and gain in papal governance of the Catholic Church. Let's begin by reminding ourselves of three basics that are pertinent to our topic. First, every decision is a choice between two goods. Otherwise, we would not have to go through the process of decision making. This means decisions seem almost by definition to entail some measure of loss. Second, every decision is subject to the law of unintended consequences. Decisions enter into the give and take of the historical process and get mauled by it. When we make a decision, we cannot foresee all the contingencies that will affect how it later affairs. Third, many decisions entail implications of which we are not aware at the time, which means that sometimes we are not doing what we think we are doing. Vatican I issued only two decrees, the first De Ephidius, on the relationship between faith and reason, and the second, Pastor Aeternus, on papal primacy and infallibility. Although it is not obvious, both decrees were intended as statements against the modern world, that is, the world that came into being in the wake of the French Revolution. Bishops who voted for Pastor Aeternus, for instance, had solid theological reasons for doing so, but some of them surely also felt they were voting for monarchy and against liberty, equality, and fraternity. At the opening of the council, the preparatory commission submitted to the bishops a 15-chapter decree on the church, in which chapter 9 dealt with the infallibility of the church, not of the papacy, 
and chapter 11 dealt with the primacy of the Roman pontiff. Pastor Aeternus was conceived as pertaining to chapter 11, the one on primacy, but it added papal infallibility to it. The emergence of a separate freestanding document that was Pastor Aeternus was not foreseen when the council convened and was the result of pressures arising in the council as it proceeded. Nor was the definition of papal infallibility foreseen. We need to remember that the first three of the four chapters of Pastor Aeternus dealt with papal primacy. Although bishops disagreed about certain details in them, they voted unanimously to approve them. It was over the fourth chapter, the chapter on infallibility, that serious disagreement arose. We need also to remember about, to, we need also to put Pastor Aeternus in a long range perspective. From the earliest centuries of the church, its governance was both collegial and hierarchical. In most cities of the Roman Empire, bishops emerged no later than the early second century as leaders of their communities, overseeing other ministers, such as deacons and presbyters. With scriptural justification from the so-called Council of Jerusalem, described in the Acts of the Apostles, they sometimes called those ministers together in councils, that is, synods, to deal in collegial fashion with issues that had arisen in their cities, had arisen in their cities. They also sometimes joined in colleagueship with other bishops of the vicinity to deal with issues of wider import. No later than the third century, bishops were paying special deference to the opinions of the Bishop of Rome, and once Christianity became the dominant religion of the Roman Empire, the deference became more pronounced, especially in the West. A new level of hierarchical structure had thus been achieved. Nonetheless, churches continued to act as self-governing institutions under the local bishop. Although this pattern continued up to the time of Vatican I, the popes began in the 11th century to demand a much greater authority, especially over secular rulers, but also over bishops. They met with considerable resistance but they were by and large successful as the centuries progressed, a feature of church governance that markedly distinguishes the second millennium of the church's history from the first. This means that Pastor Aeternus was an intensification of a centralizing process that had long been in the making. Nonetheless, popes, bishops, and secular rulers continued to recognize church-wide councils as the ultimate authority in the church. Bishops who objected to the wording of chapter four on infallibility feared that it put the authority of ecumenical councils in jeopardy. What is to be said then about loss and gain in papal governance of the church as a result of Vatican I, the title of our session? If we take the title strictly, I think we can say that the council was close to 100% gain for the papacy. For the first time since the Council of Florence in the 15th century, the council was able to make a formal statement concerning the primacy of the Roman pontiff over other bishops. It was able, moreover, for the very first time in history to de de define that when, under certain conditions, the pope speaks on infallibly, that the pope speaks infallibly that sounds to me like gain for the papacy, pure and simple. But we can have a much more fruitful discussion this afternoon if we take the word papal, if we strike the word papal from our title and talk simply about loss and gain in the governance of the church, or maybe better, loss and gain for the general well-being of the church. I assume, in fact, that that is what our organizers of the organizers of our session intended. Let's begin on a positive note. The centralizing process in church governance, of which Vatican I is a high point, occurred in tandem with the same process in the secular sphere. The ecclesiastical process of centralization seems almost inevitable 
And I think we can say that it was required by the culture in which we live. To that extent, at least, the centralization is gain. Pastor Aeternus, moreover, called Catholics out of their parochialism, provincialism, into a more expansive view of the church. It helped them attain a greater sense of belonging to an institution that transcended national boundaries, an institution that at least in its aspirations extended to the ends of the earth. For that reason, the church included in its membership persons of all races, colors, and cultures. Awareness of that reality should have reduced racial, national, and cultural prejudices among Catholics, but the evidence, unfortunately, does not support such an, infer such an inference. Nonetheless, in principle, a reduction of prejudice was there. This was countercultural. The 19th century marked the great expansion of an almost rabid nationalism, and Catholics were caught up in it. In some places, however, it took an anti-Catholic turn, most notably in Germany, in Bismarck's Kulturkampf. Although the German bishops, after the council, found themselves on the defensive in justifying Pastor Aeternus against Bismarck's attack on it, the decree provided them with a rallying point in the face of Bismarck's persecution of the church. To put such positive considerations in the most general perspective, we can say that the decree shored up the authority of the papacy, badly damaged in the 18th century, so that in the modern world, it could speak and act with an authority that was clear, independent, and wide-lensed. The loss of Rome and of the papal states between 1860 and 1870 helped eventually to foster the broad, long-ranged, and balanced vision that we attribute to the modern papacy. Mention of the loss of the states brings us face to face with a crucial factor we must take into account in assessing loss and gain in the governance of the church. That is, it is virtually impossible to disentangle a council's impact from the cultural and socio-political context in which it happened. We again remind ourselves that once concluded, the council has no control over how it is interpreted and over what its repercussions might be. The council's decisions are reshaped and refashioned according to the milieu in which they are received. Regarding the chapters on papal primacy and posture aeternus, the unification of Italy, completed with the seizure of Rome in 1870, is an excellent example to illustrate the point. When the new kingdom of Italy absorbed into itself the other political units in Italy, the concordats the Holy See had made with them became dead letters. Those concordats had all given the governments a say in the nomination of bishops. All at once, Pope Pius IX found that he had a free hand in that regard. And between October 1871 and the following May, he chose 102 bishops, filling close to half the diocese in Italy. No pope had ever had such an opportunity before. What happened in Italy was a harbinger of things to come. When in 1905, the French government unilaterally abrogated the Concordat of 1801, Pope Pius X denounced the act but found himself now free from restraint in nominating French bishops. And so it went until 1975, when upon the death of Franco, King Juan Carlos of Spain renounced the right of the Spanish government to propose candidates for the episcopacy. These events owed nothing to Pastor Eternus, but there could be no doubt that they resulted in an extremely important expansion of the field in which the primacy defined in that document was now exercised. The events gave the Pope's power to shape the worldwide episcopacy that they had never had before. This happened after Pastor Aeternus, but it did not happen because of it. 
how loss, how gain. The gain is more obvious and is often celebrated. Now the church is finally free of the state, finally free of political machinations in the choice of bishops, free from a constraint that had long been operative. Since the 11th century, popes had campaigned for the libertas ecclesiae, the liberty of the church. Now they had finally attained that goal. The bishops at Vatican I would have been appalled by the idea that Poster Aeternus could be construed as in any way advancing the separation of church and state. The council was in fact once again poised to condemn it and would almost certainly have done so had it been able to complete its agenda. For sure, the decree did not itself directly impact that development, but by so emphatically highlighting the Pope's authority to govern the church, it was unwittingly consonant with it. This change is generally counted as gain. Any loss? Perhaps. This development made the process for the choice of bishops exclusively clerical. This was new. Political, political advantage invariably figured in the Episcopal nominations governments proposed to the Holy See. Even so, rulers more often than we might expect took seriously their religious responsibilities and sometimes had a better grasp of what was needed than did the popes, who always had the right to reject nominations. Whatever were the advantages and disadvantages of that way of proceeding, they are now questions of only historical interest because there's no way to bring it back. Nonetheless, what was lost was an effective lay voice in this extraordinary, important, extraordinarily important aspect of church governance. Generally speaking, moreover, the papacies of the modern era are longer than in the past, which means popes have greater opportunity to make over the episcopacy in their own image and likeness. This might be gain. But the basic question remains, is an exclusively clerical process the best way to proceed in today's world? That is the question that events of the past few weeks have snatched out of the wounded graves of academe and has thrust naked into the public square. In any case, in this way and in others, Poster Aeternus was just one factor in promoting an ever more vivid Pope consciousness among Catholics around the world. Few are the Catholics today who do not, do not know that the name of the current Pope is Francis. This is new. It began to take off with Pius IX himself, the Pope of Vatican I. The laying of the Atlantic cable and the invention of photography and cheap newspaper print made him better known to more people than any other Pope in history. Since then, radio, television, other electronic technologies, and jet travel have made Popes international celebrities. This acute Pope awareness helped foster the idea, suggested indeed by Pastor Aeternus, that the Vatican is the source from which everything flows, rather than the center where everything comes together. Pastor Aeternus injected a new vitality into the congregations of the Roman Curia, and they began to publish decrees and directives in greater number than ever before, a phenomenon particularly characteristic of the Holy Office. This oversight had decided advantages in scuttling potential problems in their infancy, and in other ways safeguarding the unity of the church. It also functioned as a court of appeals for theologians and others who needed protection from arbitrary bishops. It, in tandem with society at large, however, also contributed to a certain homogenization or standardization and to a curtailing of local initiatives. If it sometimes helped theologians in distress, it also acted 
as an overzealous censor of them. The Council of Trent legislated as one of the principal planks in its reform of the church that bishops hold councils or synods every year. Vatican I had nothing to say about such councils, but the chapters on the primacy and poster aeternus certainly, certainly did not forbid them. Nonetheless, the growing persuasion that from the papacy all decisions flowed acted as a damper on them. The American case is typical. Between 1791 and 1875, Baltimore hosted seven local, provincial, and plenary countrywide councils, 1875. None after that, except for a diocesan synod under Cardinal Gibbons in 1884. That was the end of it. Local councils did not entirely die out in the church after Vatican I, but they were few in number and functioned with decreased prestige. I call to your attention now a new document published in March, you may be familiar with it, from the uh, International Theological Commission. Uh, this study was commissioned by Cardinal Ladaria, the chair of the commission, but also the prefect of the uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. He solemnly approved it and uh, ordered its publication after approval by Pope Francis. It's a, doctrine, a document on synods and speaks of the synodal church of today to relaunch the synodal tradition and in it, um, it very much encourages a renewal of local councils and local synods. Poster Aeternus in its totality, but especially chapter four on infallibility, gave rise to the persuasion that it made even future ecumenical councils superfluous. Now the Pope could and should make all decisions. The, deci the Vatican was the source from which everything flowed. As with local councils, Pastor Aeternus said not a word about ecumenical councils, and the matter had never been explicitly debated on the floor of the council. Nonetheless, some of the most influential promoters of infallibility, most notably Count Joseph de Mist, despised deliberative bodies in, of any sort, including councils, and saw an infallible pope with untrammeled monarchical power as the antidote to them. Such a papacy was the only solution that could save Western civilization. Many bishops at the council have been influenced by de Maistre, but just how many shared his ideas about councils is uncertain. At Vatican I, some 20% of the bishops objected to chapter four of Pastor Eternus. Although they were small in number, they were big in prestige representing the most important sees in the church. Paris, Mainz, Munich, Vienna, Prague, Turin, Milan, to say nothing of two of the most important American sees at the time, Cincinnati and St. Louis. The minority bishops held a spectrum of views on infallibility. But I think all would probably have subscribed to Bossuet's explanation of Article 4 in the Gallican Articles, Quotation, it is therefore the full and supreme and universal authority of the Catholic Church that supplies what is lacking even in the Roman Church. Close quotation. What those bishops feared about the wording of Pastor Eternus, Apostor Eternus was that it took no account of the ancient collegial component in church governance and in fact seem to render it void. They objected to the wording of chapter four because it seemed to say that papal infallibility functioned independently of the church at large, or as they put it, the head acted as severed from the body. In other words, the decree took no account of the collegial tradition. They were unsuccessful in having the wording changed which resulted in their departure before the final vote on Pastor Aeternus. Since it is in councils that the collegial tradition has found its most frequent, obvious, and important instantiation, the minority bishops saw Pastor Aeternus as implicitly discounting that tradition. 
The persuasion that Vatican I spelled the end of ecumenical councils did not, therefore, lack foundation. Papal infallibility seemed to preempt the traditional function of councils to pronounce definitively on matters of divine and apostolic faith. Chapter four of Poster Aeternus imbued papal statements, moreover, with a new dignity and doctrinal weight, even when they made no claims to infallibility. The definition set in motion a trend in theological method that theologians' task consisted to a large extent in interpreting papal, papal documents, commenting on them, and on being sure to teach in conformity with them as the authority attributed to those papal documents correlatively increased. This is a remarkable contrast, for instance, with St. Thomas's Summa, where papal documents are scarcely mentioned and the subject of papal teaching authority never systematically addressed. <clears throat> I am not sure whether this change amounts, counts as loss or gain, but it certainly counts as significant. This is especially true when we take into consideration the sheer mass of documents emanating from the congregations and other offices of the Holy See and from the popes themselves. In 1909, the Holy See, let's see where I lost my place there for a minute. In 1909, the Holy See began publishing the Acta Apostolice Sedis, which results in a stout volume each year of encyclicals, decrees of the congregations, and other official documents. This is new. Papal encyclicals, as we know them today, are essentially a product of the 19th century. And I think a case can be made that their increased frequency is due at least in part to Poster Aeternus and the success of the ultramontane movement of which Poster Aeternus was the result. At the beginning of the 19th century, Pius VII, in a pontificate of 23 years, published only one encyclical. Pius IX, the Pope of the Council, published 37. Leo XIII, his successor, published 75. Moreover, in the 20th century, the Vatican began publishing the Pope's collected speeches addresses to pilgrims, radio addresses, and similar documents. Those of Pius XI in the early 20th century amounted to six volumes of some 600 pages each. Those of his successor, Pius XII, in a pontificate of approximately the same length amounted to 20 volumes. And those of Paul VI exceeded even that number, while those by uh, of Pope John the uh, Pope John Paul II subsequently dwarfed those of Paul VI. Meanwhile, a subtle but extraordinarily important shift had taken place, at least partly as a result of chapter four of Pastor Eternus. The popes moved from being primarily judges to being teachers. This resulted, as mentioned, in other teachers becoming commentators on the papal teacher. That development does not relate directly to church governance, but it is nonetheless another aspect of the new range and degree of authority enjoyed by the modern papacy. I will close by saying that I take it as axiomatic that good governance results when a healthy balance is achieved in the interaction between center and periphery. If the center becomes too dominant, it loses touch with what is going on in the trenches and becomes stagnant and irrelevant. <clears throat> if the periphery becomes too dominant, the result is at least disarray, maybe chaos, or in extreme cases, disillusion. Fortunately, the tradition of the church that reaches back to the earliest centuries is both hierarchical and collegial. It thus makes provision for both center and periphery. The church has within its tradition, therefore, the resources to avoid either extreme and to operate as well governed. Thank you.
Masterful, thank you. I, I too want to talk about unintended consequences and mostly about losses. It's not the full picture, but it's brief enough for an afternoon delivery here. On 29 June 1868, Pope Pius IX issued the bull Eterni Patris, summoning the bishops to the Vatican Council. A particular interest, even primary interest, to the European governments was the fact that the bull extended no invitation to Catholic sovereigns or their ambassadors. This broke with a conciliar custom going as far back as the Council of Nicaea, 325. Presiding over that council, the Emperor Constantine told the assembled bishops, according to Eusebius, you on the one hand are certainly the bishops inside the church. I on the other might then be the bishop appointed by God of those outside, unquote. And so too in the Catholic West, the Catholic sovereign was a kind of episcopus externus, entitled to be present or at least represented at major church councils and synods. Such a right, in fact, was solemnly guaranteed to the Holy Roman Emperor Henry V by Pope Callistus II at the Concordat of Worms, 1122. So far as I know, never rescinded. Indeed, until 1903, some Catholic princes also exercised the right to be represented at papal conclaves by a cardinal, who was then entitled to veto papabili unacceptable to the crown. The so-called jus exclusive survived Vatican I and was last used at the conclave of 1903 by the Austrian emperor via the Archbishop of Krakow. Ecumenical councils were an affair of the church, to be sure, but Catholic rulers were not outside the church. In the second half of the 19th century, the Council of Trent remained the most recent and decisive precedent. The French king, Francis I, delayed the opening of Trent as he mulled over its ramifications for his 1516 concordat uh, Bologna, which he won virtually everything he asked for. Eventually, the Gallican contingent of 26 bishops arrived at the Council of Trent, but only after being solemnly sworn by Catherine de' Medici, queen mother and regent, not to compromise the rights won in 1516. Well into the 17th century, France and Spain blocked administrative actions of the Congregation of the Council of Trent, instituted to supervise the execution of the Tridentine Decrees. Most important was Temetzi, the first disciplinary canon appended, appended to Trent's matrimonial doctrine. It required proper canonical form, the publication of bans, exchange of vows in the presence of a priest and two other witnesses, and the priest's pronouncement of the blessing in the name of the Trinity. Some bishops and many princes worried that Temetzi was a bridge too far, that it derogated from the dignity of lay agency, namely the right instituted by Christ of a baptized man and woman to be the efficient cause of the sacrament by virtue of their consent. But that canon, Temetzi, made clerical presence sine qua non of the sacrament's validity. And it's not surprising the temporal authorities temporized and blocked universal application of that canon. In fact, Temetzi would not be universally applied across all ecclesiastical jurisdictions until after Vatican I. Maybe not because of it, but boy, there's a whole thing that happened right after that look causal to me. The Central Directing Congregation for Vatican I, which was established to oversee preparations for the Council, said that the precedent of Trent should be observed at Vatican I, that Catholic sovereigns should be invited to send oratores or ambassadors, 
But the Secretary of State, Cardinal Antonelli, refused to extend the invitation on the ground that the King of Italy was excommunicated for his government seizure of the Papal States. And Antonelli averred there could be no principle of selection between good and bad Catholic sovereigns that would not cause more political tension than inviting none of them. There was no RSVP. And this was a very big issue. It was not just a matter of etiquette. Everyone in 1868 understood that it signaled a very deep change. In France, which had been a concordatory government since 1801, Emile Olivier declared in the Chamber of Deputies, quote, the fact that no invitation to the council had been given to Catholic sovereigns was nothing less than the assertion of the severance of church and state made on the part of the church, unquote. The ever mischievous ultramontane editor of the universe, Louis Veo, gleefully agreed, princes are now outside the church. Rumor had it the Jesuits intended to use the council as the occasion to doctrinalize the Syllabus of Errors, 1864. And although the syllabus condemned the proposition that the church ought to be separated from the state and the state from the church, it also condemned a number of other propositions, numbers 41 to 54, which formed the ideological and legal basis of church-state relations. Number 50, for example, condemned the proposition that lay authority possesses of itself the right of presenting bishops. European cabinet certainly understood that this would completely change the rules of the game in favor of Rome. For with the collapse of the Papal States in 1860, they lost their most reliable lever on the papacy, which was to exact compliance with state ecclesiastical policy in exchange for military protection of the Papal dominions. On June 8, 1869, Lord Otto Russell, the unofficial British agent in Rome, sent a dispatch to the Foreign Secretary, the Earl of Clarendon, explaining just what the Vatican thought it was doing when it refused to invite the ambassadors. Russell's record of his conversation with Cardinal Antonelli is quite interesting. I'm just going to quote a few sentences from it. He told me in strict confidence that in framing the bull of convocation, the bishops alone had been invited in the Catholic governments left out because they had practically ceased to be Catholic powers by neglecting their most sacred duties toward the church and by encouraging anti-Catholic principles which popes had repeatedly condemned. Abandoned by those whose duty and interest it was to protect the church, it became the sacred duty of the pope to find means of protecting religion and moral order in the world and fulfill his divine mission on earth without the temporal support he had hitherto been able to rely on. And the convocation of the ecumenical council is the first step in that direction. He would frankly admit to me that the position of the Roman Catholic clergy in England and America was far more satisfactory than in any Catholic country at present and that he would be glad to see the Roman Church as free from state interference in all the world as it was in England and America." Unquote. This council without the laity tells us much about Vatican I and indeed why it succeeded in maintaining the visible unity of the church for the better part of a century. But maybe it tells us even more about our own situation 150 years later. So I'm going to make a series of points. They're going to be punchy, and we'll see what happens. First, once upon a time, lay authority really meant something. It involved both a legal and a customary constitution that it had evolved in the West since Carolingian times. Lay authority within the church stood on three stools. Baptism, which confers, confers participation in the munera of Christ, priest, prophet, and king. The fount of ruling flows from baptism first, not from holy orders. It's only because it flows from baptism can there be a ministerial function called holy orders. To rule is for the baptized. Second, marriage, by which two baptized laity give their consent to matrimonial union in which they are themselves, and not the minister, the efficient cause of the sacrament. 
And finally, by this vague notion of an external bishop who cares for the temporal order of the faithful, which ensues at least, if not from the nature of polity, at least a polity overseen by a baptized Christian. So, on the eve of the French Revolution, there were so-called crown cardinals. Bernie for France, Soli for Spain, Orsini for Naples, Conti for Portugal, Mizani for Austria. They were in Rome for the very purpose of making sure that a balance obtained between the family dynasties and their relations to the church. They were, in fact, curial prelates whose job was to represent the laity in Rome. <coughs> Virtually all of the missions to the New World post-1492 were undertaken by lay rulers and explorers having quasi-apostolic credentials. From the Great Lakes to Tierra del Fuego to the Philippines, Moluccas, that great exploration and moment of evangelization was overseen by Catholic families, lay people, all the way down to the viceroy level. Question that maybe unintended consequences. Why at Vatican I would Rome allow this constitution in balance of clerical and lay authorities to be torn asunder? The easy answer would be clericalism, but that's not right. In fact, the reason was quite the opposite. It was the laicization of the church, both clerical and lay by the civil constitution of the clergy, 1790 in the revolution. And it wasn't just in France, various kinds of civil constitutions of the clergy were enacted throughout Europe and the former colonies. So we were no longer talking about lay authorities so much as laicized authorities, clerical and lay. As I make sense of the pastor eternus and what follows it. They were responding to a legitimate crisis, the laicization of the church, not its clericalization. One example will suffice. From 1793, which is at the very summit of the crises over the civil constitution of the clergy, Pius VI is on duty, all the way until the mid-1960s, the inner governance of the church vis-a-vis the secular and lay powers, was done by the Congregation for Extraordinary Ecclesiastical Affairs. Almost anyone who was anything from Pius VI all the way to Paul VI, governing the inside of the church, was a member of that committee at one point or another. Now look at the name, Extraordinary, the Congregation for Extraordinary Ecclesiastical Affairs. And it says extraordinary because once upon a time, people still knew that a clerical church com that completely transcends political ties to laity was extraordinary. It was not the way things had been done for centuries. In hindsight and in foresight from the early 19th century, the pope Center church made sense even before it was a done deed. And Catholics became accustomed to it. Even so, the civil constitution of the clergy in 1790 is the greatest single disaster for the evolution of the laity in the Roman Catholic Church in, in all of history. It was a disaster. And I don't believe in any practical way Vatican II really touched, much less recovered this. Next point. Orestes Browns in the 19th century once said, the layman under responsibility we hold may take the initiative and not await it from clerical authority. This is no more than princes and nobles have always been allowed or assumed unrebuked the right to do. And princes and nobles are only laymen. What a crowned or titled layman may do, a free American citizen, though uncrowned and untitled, may also do. It was a very effective retort. And Brownson may be right in principle, but he wildly underestimated the situation of the laity in the democratic age and Rome's reaction to that. 
no lay person after 1870 ever did what crowned entitled laymen did once upon a time. Believe me, no, no lay person has been on the floor of the papal conclave vetoing candidates. The post-1870 hierarchy shepherded its clergy and laity in large part away from political affairs. Example, profound mistrust of Catholic political parties. Exactly the kind of thing laity might do. And this was because of the Roman question in Italy and later the ideological parties of left and right or anything that might threaten the unity of the church. Laity were generally discouraged from directly entering the political fray, at least as Catholics. Continual peremptory rulings against voluntary societies. American bishops were hounded by the propaganda because we allowed Elks clubs and so many different kinds of associations that had at least some whiff of a Masonic club and American bishops like Archbishop Ireland kept on saying, you don't understand what these things mean in Iowa. What these things mean in Iowa is not what they mean in Italy. But you know, it would take a long time for Rome to loosen up even on something like these arbitrary societies that we call civil societies. Perhaps the most important issue, post-Vatican I, was the school issue. If you go back and read the Roman Catechism, it's very clear that the duty of parents is to educate their children in religion. That's what the Catechism was for, to help the pastors educate the parents, and for the parents to be the first educators of their children. But by 19th century, Baltimore III, the obligation was no longer of the parents to teach the religion to their children, but of the parents to submit to parish schools. Listen, when those things collapsed in the late, in the late 1960s, there was, there was a reason. It, it was an obligation not to teach your children, not to teach the children, but to send them to the religiously controlled schools. And the reason our vast system of catechism is broken down over the course of our lifetime is because the parents weren't doing that for 60 or 70 years because they had to send their child off to the Catholic school or someone else did it. The 1917 Code of Canon Law ramped up very tightly the canonical requirements regarding marriage. And it's interesting because this is the era that many Catholic lay people regard somewhat nostalgically. But the entry of lay people into the political or even into the civil society or into the major issue of the late 19th century, which was education, was not very deeply encouraged by Rome. And it is true that after 1945, Rome had a much rosier view of lay involvement in political parties in center-right Christian democratic parties, especially in Europe. It, they were, among other things, bulwarks against Bolshevism. But, as Vigadimus says, states, Quote, it's of great importance, especially in a pluralistic society, to work out a proper vision of the relationship between the political community and the church, and to distinguish clearly between the activity of Christians acting individually or collectively in their name as citizens guided by the dictates of Christian conscience, and their activity in communion with the pastors in the name of the church. The church, by reason of her role in competence, is not identified with any political community, nor bound by ties to any political system, she is at once the sign and the safeguard of the transcendental dimension of the human person. At the same time, and this is felt today as a pressing responsibility, the lay faithful must bear witness to those human and gospel values that are intimately connected with political activity itself, such as liberty and justice, solidarity, 
faithful and unselfish dedication to the good of all, a simple lifestyle, preferential love for the poor and the least. But as my esteemed, unfortunately deceased colleague and friend, Emile Perrault uh, Saucine has observed about that passage, just as the vocation and mission of the laity was being valorized, especially to things that begin to touch the political, the papal teachings increasingly emphasize not merely the secondary but tertiary position of the political. The church herself and her clerics are not members of parties, nor do they identify with any political system. It's number one, primary. Secondary is the culture of international human rights, uh, culture without borders in which we can speak of governance but not government. And then maybe government, real government, where people actually legislate and command and require obedience for the sake of the common good. So it was a kind of cruel moment after Vatican II that the depoliticization of the clergy, deconfessionalization of the state, and the increased role of the ordinary magisterium left lay Catholics without the thing that was supposed to be their primary mission outside of the family, which was to enter the political. Vatican I valorized it and then reduced the political to best tertiary values. Um, the human and gospel values mentioned in Gaudium et Spes could apply to any mode of sociability in which Christians operate. Religious orders, dioceses, movements, humanitarian groups, all should affirm values of solidarity, unselfish dedication to the good of all, simple lifestyle, and so forth. It doesn't capture what is unique to the laity. What does apply solely and uniquely to the laity? Not being a, a Eucharistic minister, because priests and deacons can do that just as well. Actually, not marriage and family life, because there are some exceptions to that. The fundamental thing that belongs to the laity, it seems, is disposing the fundamental principles of social and political life to an array of prudential choices. But how are the laity to do that if the political is held to be inferior to the global humanitarian? And how are they to do that immersed in a confetti storm of pontifical teachings on every imaginable and controversial political, social, and economic issues, where the ordinary magisterium, not the infallible, but the ordinary magisterium, upholds morals as a placeholder for opinion about every conceivable policy. What is left for the prudence of the laity? They've already been squeezed out of the picture. And so the Pope, and I'm not talking just about Francis here, this goes back a ways, who is not political and insists that he is not political, is fully engaged in every kind of politics short of actually governing a temporal unit outside of Vatican City. And one worries that the social, the social teaching galore on everything is unintentionally losing its efficacy in creating Catholic solidarity. It's subject to the law of diminishing returns where everything from the morality of air conditioning to immigration to abortion is put together. So I'm, I'm going to count post-1870 for the laity as being a loss. And I certainly agree with Father O'Malley. We can't bring back. Uh, Austrian emperors vetoing papabili. We can't bring that back. Uh, canon law would have to be so deeply revised uh, to moderate this that I'm not sure anyone's capable of doing it today. But it's been a loss in the sense we have in 150 years not found a new version of something very old. It's one thing to destroy Gallicanism. It's another thing to cut the laity out of government 
both ad intra and ad extra. This is the Crises of the Laity 3.0. Crises of the Laity 1.0 is the civil constitution of the clergy, of the church. It was a crisis. 2.0 is post-Vatican I, in which in order to protect the unity of the church, laity were discouraged from joining political parties, educating their children, except for maybe saying how to say the pater noster, being submitted to the system of the schools. 3.0, crisis 3.0, is that it was not long after the Second Vatican Council where the laity got used to not having to do any of this work, that we find out that the hierarchy turned out to be stupendously incompetent in governing things that they had authority over. Right? But what's the solution on the part of the laity? What are you going to do? Have a plebiscite? You know, bring back Franz Joseph? And I pose that as a question. Thank you. I get to respond to this. Uh, and my response will not answer directly the, the final question of uh, Professor Hittinger, but it might, might cast a sidelong glance at it. And speaking of sidelong, I, uh, I want to start by taking this train on a little siding, and I hope to get back to the main line uh, not too far into my remarks. After his introduction, Victor Hugo began the first volume of his mammoth La Légende des Siècles, The Legend of the Ages, by describing in 11 pages of 12 syllable lines the vision of human history at the source of this vast collection of poems which he began to publish in 1859. He sees the centuries of human history stretched before him like some enormous facade a cementing together of all past human lives, arrayed in a clear order, the key to which escapes him. Tous les siècles, le front saint de tours ou des pies était là, morne sphinx sur l'énigme accroupi. All the centuries, their foreheads crowned with towers or spikes were there, drear sphinxes crouched on the enigma. While he cannot figure out the enigmatic and obscure movement of the centuries and emphasizes repeatedly the foggy character of the edifice he sees in a dream, he points out that this massive structure of ages flows endlessly continuous like a stream as he walks along its front wall, which reaches as infinitely high as the sky. The more he looks at this wall of the ages, the clearer its details become to him. The heroes, the criminals, the famous and anonymous, all connected with each other across the centuries. The convinced Democrat Hugo sees the terrible path of monarchies through history, strewing malfeasance and suffering at every turn. In some, he says, Je revoyais là le vieux temps oublié, je le sondais. Le mal au bien était lié, ainsi que la vertèbre est jointe à la vertèbre. I was seeing again here the old forgotten time. I was sounding its depths. Evil was linked to good as vertebra is joined to vertebra. Suddenly, in his vision, in his dream, two peals of thunder from two flying spirits, one the Oresteia crying fate, and the other in the New Testament apocalypse crying, God, shake the wall of history, and that wall shatters like a window falling into the night. The unity of human history is broken in numberless pieces, 
and its universe becomes a dark, flooded cemetery, the centuries lying like upended grave markers, each separate from all the others. But over this scene, the future rises like a star by whose one light one can sense God. The book that comes out of this dream is, Hugo writes, the tradition fallen to the earthquake of the revolutions that God unleashes and pushes on. It is what is left after an earthquake, ruins with which the future is mixed like a vague dawn. Here we have a brilliant and sensitive portrayal of what the 19th century felt like to so many. The revolutions wrought by what seemed a combination of divine providence and fate had smashed to disordered pieces the confidently secure vision of all former times linked to us and among themselves. A hopeful new age was opening, but at the price of giving up forever the solidity of human unity across the ages and continents. Believing that the world could not go on without this unity and solidity, most Catholics in the 19th century found a new version of them in the Pope's universal jurisdiction and infallible teaching office. Before Hugo had written La Légion des Siècles, many priests of the lower clergy had celebrated the demolition of an edifice of monarchy seemingly as vast as the ages because their bishops had been on the side of the monarchs putting their feet athwart the simple priest's necks. As John O'Malley's book shows, many priests, say in France, supported ultramontane positions. For most of the laity, God had kept the great wall of history as one continuous human flow. Yes, with suffering and glory, and vast expanses of experience in between. To break that flow through democratic or totalitarian revolution was to establish a godless social order to the relief of some and to the horror of others. A papal rule of universal reach and infallible access to truth was then a last ditch work of God holding the world together under the assault of apocalyptic forces. At the same time, the new definition of the Pope's authority implicitly admitted that the old church and the old human unity could never come back, which is something that we've heard from both of our speakers. Both John O'Malley and Russell Hittinger have expressed well the precise unifying efficacy of the tool that the primacy and the charism of infallibility offered to a church facing the shock of the new in a world as broken up as Hugo's preface and Picasso's canvas of the bombing of Guernica. The tool can be tricky to wield, however, as the trials and errors of the popes since Pius IX have shown. And we've had a lot of testimony to that here. The ever-deepening stream of papal statements, long and short, printed, televised, and tweeted, long ago overflowed the banks of manageability. And as John the 23rd and Paul the 6th before him, Francis does sometimes seem caught in the infernal logic of trying to depyramidize and decentralize the church through the exercise and therefore reinforcement of a supreme authority at the center and ever higher top of Catholicism. Add to this situation the globalization of triumphant Western bureaucracy and the media culture that makes stars and villains but leaves room for few other characters in its stylized dramatic universe. These forces leave us with a network of papal offices and institutions and a mercurially alternating saccades of papal popularity and execration. So Christ's petrine gift to the church struggles simply to live as the ministry in charism that Vatican I and Vatican II tell us it is. It's an institution, it's celebrity, it's all kinds of things. 
Like the church itself, the papacy draws its breath in a world that does not always leave the air as clean as it needs. It has ever been thus and ever will be until Jesus comes back. Catholics have wielded the imperfection of the papacy's unitive valence against the dispersion of modern culture in which Christians must pursue the divine imperative of ecclesial oneness. It's been an imperfect use of of this unitive valence. I wonder then at those otherwise quite responsible theological authors who continue to speak of the papacy as a divinely willed guarantor of the church's unity. I hear this in ecumenical discussion uh, too often. Even after acceptance of its dogmatized primacy, the papacy seems to guarantee so little. No institution, even by divine right, whether a sacrament like the mass or a ministry like the papacy, will keep in actual communion Christians who think that other values have to come before living with each other in unity like members of the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit himself does not force church unity on our perverse hearts. So it is hard to see how the papacy can function as a guarantee, even if divinely vouchsafed, of church unity. Yet over the last 175 or 200 years, so many Catholics have fought for the papal dogmas with a verve that comes from belief that only the papacy could keep together a church prone to division, living in a divided world. Their efforts and those of the Catholics who opposed those arguments with calls for more collegiality have often taken attention away from something Victor Hugo's dream vision missed. It is Christian faith that holds together in a continuous stream the multi-secular and multinational Christian edifice, which differs from the one Hugo dreamt because by our Lord's promise, no revolutionary movement can smash that continuity entirely. Before the papacy, our faith has always been what holds Christians together and always will. Like the foggy unity of Hugo's wall, The way the unity of our faith reaches across the ages and the continents is not always clear to us. But again, like Hugo's vast building of humanity, the fact of this unity is certain. Papal primacy in government and doctrine serves that unity, but does not establish it. That role is played by the church's tradition and its scriptures through which, as Vatican II's Dei Verbum teaches, In paragraph 8, God speaks without interruption with the spouse of his beloved son, and the Holy Spirit leads believers into all truth and makes the word of Christ to dwell in them abundantly. The papal ministry is part of that tradition, but not its heart. Vatican I already proclaimed that the church's dogma maintains Christians in a faith, in a faith unity across the ages a unity every bit as impressive, living, and solid as the great pre-revolutionary facade of Victor Hugo's vision. In its last chapter in the canons connected to it, Vatican I's Constitution on the Catholic Faith, Dei Filius, taught that the meaning of dogma remains constant once the Church defines it, even as the understanding of that meaning progresses throughout the ages. Dei Filius left to the church's later reflection the question of how this constancy and development can go together. But Vatican I's teaching on this point affirmed that the communion in the same meaning over the ages among Christians who have held to a given dogma remains entire, even if their accounts of that meaning and so of that communion differ from one century or continent to the next. That communion in meaning is a communion in faith, a reality per se perceptible only to faith. The growth in the understanding of a dogma's meaning is also per se perceptible to faith alone. 
Historians can detect the differences in a dogma's meaning over time and from one place to another. But judging whether those differences are growth or decline, continuity or substantial change in the faith lies, behind the competence, lies beyond the competence of scholarship that is not based on faith. If historical scholarship wants to make that judgment, it has to become historical theology. Thus, the unity of Christian tradition is a unity in a communal act of faith. And that unity itself is an article of faith, or at least part of an, a couple of articles of faith. For example, those on the apostolicity of the church and on the communion of saints. My impression uh, of reading some of the 19th century arguments for the definition of papal primacy and infallibility in John O'Malley's book and in reading some cases for papal authority in our own time, is that they result from a loss of nerve in our belief in the church's unity of faith across the ages and continents. Yes, by his gracious gift, God has made constitutive for the church the pope's primacy and infallibility. But our conception of the need for that gift as is true for so many of the gifts that God gives us, can get skewed. No papal act can guarantee our unity in faith, still less establish that unity. To think we need the papacy to do so looks often like a failure to remember the root of our unity in faith over the centuries and across the seas. The papacy has effectively served that unity, but the Petrine charism is neither the first nor the last hope for maintaining the continuously flowing wall of Christianity's own legend of the ages. God, his filial word, and the Holy Spirit are our sole hope for a church that can continue to live united off of its apostolic taproot of scripture and tradition. The more this point of Christian faith and hope are strengthened in us, the less we will lose and the more we will gain through our recourse to the papal ministry, the proper task of which is precisely to support the exercise of our prior divine gift of unity and faith, hope, and love. Yes, every bitter controversy, every schism and real heresy sickens that unity and the papacy must help to remedy such ills. But just as doctors cannot guarantee life to their patients, the Petrine charism is no guarantee of the church's oneness. The Pope and his fellow Christians, his fellow Catholics, like doctors and their patients, do, do well to remember to leave such things to God. And the way I would like to connect these remarks to what I just heard from uh, Professor Hittinger is to say that this unity and faith that I'm talking about is, of course, baptismal and is the basis of lay identity in the church and uh, because it's the basis of the laos, the, the people that is the church. Um, so, you know, I think we, we can maybe jump too quickly, perhaps especially in America, I don't know, to uh, some sort of institutional solution to our cent centrifugal tendencies towards division when, uh, you know, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism really are the basis for what the papacy is meant to support. So I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, we have some time for uh, discussion and Q&A. Uh, first, I'm going to give the opportunity to the speakers to respond to each other, and I think we can just go uh, in 
in the same order in which you presented, and then we'll open it up uh, for Q&A uh, with the audience. Well, Professor Hittinger, I do have some comments. First of all, I'm just some uh, individual points. Uh, Tom Etsy, the, the decree of, uh, of the Council of Trent on uh, marriage that's uh, requiring a, a cleric. I mean, I think we need to remember that was actually passed in favor of the laity. It was passed because it was seen as a defense against the so-called clandestine marriages when a man and a woman without witness would uh, say that they were married and the church recognized that. Uh, but then there was no witness, so two years later, one of the partners, usually the man, could say no marriage, and he's out chasing another woman and leaving the babies behind. So there was, a, there was a, an abuse, a big abuse, and the, the, the decree was hotly debated in the council because they, they said, yes, the, the, the marriage is constituted by the consent of the two partners. How can the church um, uh, make a legislation concerning it? And uh, but they finally decided to do it. But I say to remember that that was done in favor of the laity. I was also puzzled. Well, first of all, I was amazed that Cardinal Antonelli would hold up England and, Amer and the states as ideals because certainly that was not true of the Pope himself who felt that uh, this, what, what was going on in Belgium and uh, this was all the, the, this was liberal Catholicism, which for Pius IX was, was anathema. And one other point, uh, the, the minor point here. Oh, yes. <laughs> when you said the laity feels overwhelmed by this flurry of ecclesiastical documents. How do you think the clergy feels? <laughs> <laughs> we are just as overwhelmed as anybody else. Uh, so, but anyway, I guess the, my bigger question and comment is, uh, yes, uh, the, the, the laity after Vatican I, uh, be, and I think because of the whole situation in the 19th century, was uh, effectively excluded from a, an effective voice. Uh, but uh, I don't think, I mean, I hope you weren't implying that was a conspiracy to do it. Uh, uh, it's uh, the way things were, they didn't know, everybody was kind of fumbling around in this new situation. So uh, I'll stop there and see what you have to say. But, um, oh, one other point, yeah, the, when you said that uh, the, uh, especially true of the United States, that, that the church was uh, trying to take the instruction of children out of the hands of parents. I don't think that was true at all. Uh, certainly in the United States, the, the Catholic schools, they wanted, I mean, many bishops wanted that system to go forward. But I don't think it was intended to leave, relieve parents of their obligation. So anyway, I'll stop there and see what you have to say. Yeah. Um. No, uh, not a conspiracy, but a, a detectable logic to the whole thing, which is what I'm trying to call attention to. Uh, Trent very much emphasizes the obligation of the parents to educate their children in the true religion. Uh, of course, at the time of Trent, there wasn't a school system like there emerges after compulsory education legislation throughout the Western world. But I think Archbishop Ireland is still, who, who was a major player in this problem in the 19th century, is still worth reading because he pointed out everything I just said. In fact, I was paraphrasing him in some places. Uh, the weakness of it was that the emphasis was on the obligation to send your kid to the Catholic school. The emphasis was not on the, edu on, on the obligation to be the first catechist, as though this was what we now call an ecclesiola of some kind. Number two, it robbed, the, and we had to bring in too many quasi-trained religious to man these schools. 
And for three or four generations of Catholics, lay Catholics, simply had no incentive to develop catechetical skills that, be, that actually now are absolutely necessary because we don't have that school system anymore. It, it, it's not as vigorous. And the, the restoration of lay catechesis is crucial. I think the Catholic school thing after three Baltimore was a discouragement. I'm, I'm not saying a, a plot. And by the way, there's all kinds of reasons to have parish schools. Yeah. Uh, I agree completely. Uh, and with the other things, like the tightening of matrimonial requirements post-1917, I think the 1983 code has done a good job in softening those, or making them more complicated. Uh, the, uh, as for Temetsi, um, yeah, the reason so many bishops were worried about that is not because they denied a problem with clandestine marriages, uh, but because the clear teaching of Jesus Christ was the, uh, the ability of the baptized man and woman to be the cause of the sacrament, uh, and that the absence of a legal clerical witness does that invalidate the sacramental action itself? Well, it wouldn't be sacramental in the, in the sense of, uh, of this, uh, these two people uh, exchanging vows. That would not be a sacramental. I mean, so you have this whole ev evolution of the sacrament of matrimony mm -hmm. at the same time. So I wouldn't call it sacramental. Uh, it, but Joe wants to get here. Yeah, just, one, just one last thing about, what was the last issue you raised? Oh, about... Uh, Yes, Antonelli. Yeah. Well, yeah, he said it a lot more than that, too. It was interesting. The, I think that the goof, the misjudgment of the 19th century in Rome was blowing off the Belgian experiment. Mm -hmm. Because Belgian, Belgium was the first country in Western Europe in its constitution to disallow the Jus Patronatus that is, the nomination and other sorts of rights of civil authority. It's renounced in the 1831 Constitution. And that's why the Catholic liberals who are ultra-Montanist to a considerable extent in France said, it's Belgium that we should be using as right. the model. Absolutely, yeah. And, but it was too late. I mean, by the time Vatican I came, Belgium has, which was actually sliding down the other side. It was not looking like a very good model by about 1870. Uh, but that's enough. Let me just say that I went to public schools myself and had catechism on Sunday taught by a lay person. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to speak to just that last point um, and say that this is uh, this matter of uh, the transmission of the faith to one's children. Uh, certainly has a, a very American coloring here because of our history of debates about uh, Catholic schools or, or religion to be taught in public schools and all of that. Um, but I think the discouragement of the transmission of the faith by the laity is not just an American phenomenon in, um, in our time. And I had a, an experience of this when, when I was in grad school and uh, was asked to help uh, volunteer parents to do the catechism in the Jesuit grade school uh, in Paris, which was an elite grade school. It was the first time I had ever heard of that, um, with an entrance exam to get into kindergarten. Uh, but so these were kind of high class folk. And I remember sitting down with them and, and they would say, well, you know, we really don't know what to say to these kids because, you know, um, we're worried that we're going to say the wrong thing. And, you know, what do we know? And, uh, and I thought, well, I was a young priest. I, I'll empower them, you know. So, um, so I said something like, well, you know, you can't pass on what you don't have. So 
tell them the faith that you do have. And you know it'll be good enough and down the line somebody else will help them out and if there's a problem with what you passed on, it'll get corrected maybe. Um, they could not take that kind of advice on board. Maybe it was stupid advice, but, but they, they, they couldn't see it. Um, so the idea that they were capacitated uh, to do this was very foreign to them. And I think that's true for a lot of, of uh, Catholic parents in different places. Um, the comments that I was that I had written originally before I, I fell on fell in love with this thing from Victor Hugo. Sorry about that. Um, was going to emphasize uh, the importance of Dei Filius in the story of the papacy, um, which John, you know, didn't emphasize very much in the book and. There are good reasons for that, and it, you know it works fine. I mean, he mentions it here and there, and 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 has a, a, a good section on Dei Filius. But I think um, one of the things about uh, Dei Filius that is is an important part of the history of uh, the papacy and of the aftermath of Pastor Eternus is the endorsement of the non-contradiction between science and faith. Um, and the reason I think this has to do with the history of uh, papal authority and our conceptions of it since Vatican I is that part of the really big difference between Vatican II's treatment of the papacy in Vatican I's treatment is the fact that after the modernist crisis, which took the non-contradiction between faith and reason to one side, in a sense, um, people took this non-contradiction very seriously, and in particular in historical scholarship, and um, Catholics jumped into the study of the papacy uh, very, very seriously and said, we're not going to leave this to the Protestants who have their own kind of slant on this. And um, the result was uh, big modifications in the way theologians <laughs> spoke of the papacy, and especially ones who ended up being very influential at Vatican II. So I think uh, in that respect, that, um, even though it was maybe not intended that way, once again, at, at Vatican I, the very strong uh, assertion of non-contradiction between the deliverances of human reason well used on one hand and the perception of the truth that we have through faith um, did a lot for the changing of points of view on uh, theological points of view at least on, on the papacy. So I, that's why I think Dei Filius has, a, has an important role in this history of ultra, ultramontanism that you've written. Um, so I would say that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Could I say something on this? Yeah. You know, I don't think there is a declaration by Pius IX of the separation of church and no, state. No, I mean, no. this is the way the French prime minister read it as, as an implication of uh, not being invited. There's a rhetorical aspect to this because he wants to say that, you know, your decision not to invite us, first of all, we hate the idea of we're being snubbed and, and there are good reasons for us to be there. And secondly, I want to make you look like you're contradicting yourself, so I'm going to say that you're in favor of the separation of church and state when you're on record just a few years ago as saying it's an awful, awful thing. So, I mean, there's part of that. But um, 
to the extent that there is, there is substance to what he's saying in that speech, the, the French prime minister, I mean, he's saying that this is uh, an implication of the policy about invitations mm -hmm. to the council. He's not saying that there's, there's a, a, an ex professo statement that we need to separate church and state. Also, I think it needs to be emphasized that uh, whatever the implications were, whatever was behind their minds, the upfront reason that they didn't, they knew the precedent uh, from Trent, they were perfectly aware of that, but they thought the situation was too volatile, too changed, uh, too uh, untraditional, that they didn't know exactly how to go about it. How would you, would, so they left it open, sort of just saying, well, they should co the government should cooperate, and so the idea was if they wanted to send a representative, they could, and the governments understood that, at least some of the governments understood that, the French understood that, and they decided not to send anybody. And that's probably the better thing to do. I don't, it would have been sort of counterproductive for them, and I think very, it's kind of a strange body in the council as, as the council evolved. But at any rate, so, yeah. But no, I, I, yeah, I mean, they were, I mean, Pius IX and all those folks, I mean, Leo the Thirteenth and so forth, they did set against separation of church and state. And that was a problem up until Vatican II. I mean, ostensibly, out front. Yeah. Although in the syllabus, it's not just the separation of church and state that's condemned. I swear in those 10 articles that preceded, all of the actual legal and customary guts of union of church and state are condemned. Yeah, well, that's a good example of their not, of bias putting those things together not seeing the implication of what they were saying. Mm -hmm. Don't you say, what you yeah. yeah, they don't. And, and to a reasonable person in the third, I mean in France or, or in Vienna or wherever, could say to themselves, hey, the, the church wants its cake and eat it too here on this exactly. one. In other words, we're not gonna rule out any kind of union on our terms. But all the ones that have accrued over X number of centuries, not those. And I think part of that uh, is because they looked at these, it was, it was similar to what you were just saying, John, I think. They looked at all of these old, cust this customary apparatus, and they said, well, I mean, you know, since, uh, you know, last few decades, the meaning of all of these things is very different. And we can't just go with this stuff now because um, it's, its effect has been, in their minds, perverted by so many things that had happened you know, since 1789, for example, but even before, because there was a lot of pressure on, um, on papal authority from the enlightened uh, monarchs of the 18th century. And you know, if someone is going to ask the question, if Chinese communists can nominate bishops, why can't Catholic lay people? And you know, the strange thing is, of course, we don't know what the agreement is, but if the agreement is the Pope having veto power, it's long established that he who vetoes does not nominate. But the veto is not a nomination. So it's, it's easy to say, so let the lay people nominate which lay people? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah which lay people? Yeah. What's, so that's, that's the practical problem. Uh, the 50 Catholic billionaires throughout the world, are they the ones who nominate? Uh, or who does it? So that's the problem with uh, lay authority is it's so diffuse. Mm -hmm. uh, so how are you going to mobilize it in a fair, uh, broad-lensed way? So. So, I mean, it's interesting with this new document uh, by the uh, uh, International uh, Theological Commission about the synods and so forth, and they're very clear on lay participation. Now, again, the same problem recurs, right? Yeah. Which, which lady, how do you do it? But yeah. on the parish level, it's a little easier. And, and I certainly agree with your, your first point and objection, which I think is 
the problem that was built into the age, in which what was meant by lay before then could have meant not under religious <coughs> vows of religion. It could have meant not ordained, not a cleric. But it could also mean, and it plainly did mean for century, something representative. Uh, that is, your prince or king, and maybe even his family lineage, right? So in a democratic age, it's really complicated to say who has that particular function, lay function. Or maybe 60 in a revolution. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I agree, and by the way, I, I know why after 1870, the, the Rome was so skittish about approving of Catholic political parties. And why in the United States, the propaganda just kept on hectoring American bishops about all of these associations, you know, from Elks Clubs to all kinds of other things. I know why they were doing that. That uh, it was really hard to read what the situation of ordinary lay Catholics was in this kind of an age. And I mean, who do they belong to and who represents them? Are, there being, are they being stolen by political parties? Uh, I agree. And that's why I think one at the time would have given Rome a break on a lot of this. I mean, some saying, okay, okay, there really was the dangers of nationalisms, secret associations, and so on and so forth. But I look back and I say, there's a pattern to the whole thing, which is for however good the reason might have been of especially diminishing lay political authority. It added up to something that also had a really downside to it. And, you know, by the way, I have one story to tell about the confetti of papal teaching. So, because I'm in the uh, Academy of Social Sciences, which actually wrote the first draft, kind of, of Laudato Si. Uh, which document? Laudato Si. Oh, yeah, Laudato yeah. Si. Yeah. Anyway, so my pastor says, why don't you come over and talk to the parish? I said, okay. And I developed a very short and unproblematic, I, I didn't make a big deal of any problems in it. I just tried to say what was in it, how, how, how it was structured. And when my wife and I pulled up three o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, the parking lot was full and I turned to her and said, this is gonna be a problem. Well, I went in, the place was packed and I gave my little presentation. Remember, Tulsa, Oklahoma used to be the oil capital of the world. And within 10 minutes of my speech being over, I saw that my pastor and assistant had fled. They were no longer the back door, they were gone. <laughs> And I had the audience trying to take the microphone out of my hands. And it was over air conditioning. And it was over in carbon dioxide. And these were oil families. And, and they, they were in a fighting mood about it all. And I wasn't in a position to say, well, the Pope is not commanding you never to do carbon tax swaps. That's not really. And they said, well, that's what he says right there, right? Right in the document. And so, yeah. no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> okay. Final question. Well, I think so. I mean, because I think that. Uh, this whole, the, the definition of papal infallibility, as you know, I mean, strictly speaking, has been invoked only once since Vatican I and once before Vatican I. But it did uh, give uh, papal teachings, papal documents, uh, a new dignity, uh, so on and so forth. It's all part of a bigger scene, though, of focus on the papacy. And I think it's also uh, good to remember, like Laudato Si, I mean, uh, Rerum Novarum did not have a good, uh, an easy path of it. Many Catholics felt this was betrayal. Uh, the Pope was supposed to stand for order, was supposed to stand for the, the uh, uh, established classes of society, and certainly to allow workers to organize, this was not acceptable. 
So, but they did, as I, as I agree with you, they did add a certain dignity and importance to them in a general kind of way. I'd like to make a comment too. Um, and um, it's about the exercise of infallibility in an explicit way by the Pope. I think one reason why it hasn't been used very much is that, um, you know, if it increases the prestige, prestige is a very slippery thing. And uh, if part of that prestige is that it's supposed to unify the church, which may be a confusion between teaching and judging, in my mind, mm -hmm. um, you know, if a pope comes out with something and makes it very, very clear that he intends this to be uh, something ex cathedra, uh, the result of the charisma and the hallability and all of that, and people say, uh, no, well, then we got a real problem, okay? And I, th I think all of the popes since Pius IX have thought about this. If they've ever been tempted to use this, um, you know, it, in other words, I don't think it is a charism which can be exercised to end debate because that's really risky. Um, I think the way it can actually be used is to, is to settle something that's already largely been settled, to declare it settled. Um, you know, we've seen, the history of the church has seen, has seen a lot of ups and downs of councils trying to settle debates, and it, it often doesn't work very well. Um, and you end up having, the council will create a, a new phase of the controversy. Because people, if they're not ready to come together, this is the point I wanted to make in my mm -hmm. paper, they're not going to do it. And then you have an infallible <coughs> statement that no one's listening to, which is really not a good thing for the church. Or at least many people aren't listening to. Well, I think the thing to remember about a strictly speaking infallible definition is the Pope is saying this is of apostolic and divine faith. Yeah. I mean, that is really serious business. In other words, right. you have to accept this if you're a Catholic. It's not, uh, you know, it's not the supermarket. You're not free not to accept it. Uh, that's a big step. No wonder they're wary. Yeah. Uh, I think right. they ought to be, it has to be really, more, really more serious. wary than they are. Yeah.